Sterling, that's because the camera over there. It's easy. Yeah. It's recording you. I'll see it. Good to see you, everyone. My name is Robbie Howell. I am a tabletop game designer, a lover of history, and a lifelong player of Age of Empires II. And in this series, Theory Crafting, I take civilizations not yet implemented in the game and take my best stab at designing a believable, interesting, and historically accurate mechanical framework for them. On this particular episode, I'd like to direct your attention to the poll on screen. You see who's in third place there? Kind of weird that I would choose them for an episode when there are two other perfectly good builds ahead of them in the queue. That is up until I was reached out to by the good people over at Gamer Legion who have kindly shouted out my channel on their Twitter. And in return, I suggested that they request a civilization design to pair with their shout out. And wouldn't you know it, their choice didn't line up brilliantly with this particular poll. That's not to say, however, that they were the only ones who wanted this civilization. We've gotten a bunch of comments on the channel from all sorts of wonderful commenters like yourself saying that they wanted to see it as well. And as such, without any further ado, I present to you the Novgorodians. Yes, the Novgorodians, one of the first republics known to the medieval world. And their footprint on history was far larger than I expected, and probably larger than you may have anticipated as well. Obviously, this build is being derived from the Slavs as part of my ongoing quest to split that civilization into many more fitting ones. If you want to see any disclaimers on this particular build, or a general summary of my philosophy as a designer going into this process, please take a look on screen right now. And as always, if you want to see a full document with all of the details on this build, all of the numbers, all the specifics, all the everything, take a look at my civilization doc down in the description. It includes all of my sources. And with all that being said, let's jump into Novgorod. The history of Novgorod. The northern Slavs in general clustered around Novgorod very early on in history. It was one of the largest settlements in all of what we now know as Russia, not to mention one of the first, serving as a trade hub that connected the Baltic all the way down through the Dardanelles and out into the Mediterranean. And as such, it started to concentrate power quite early. Now, the Slavic peoples who lived in Novgorod were fairly peaceable, relatively speaking, during the early stages of the AOE2 relevant time frame, and as such, they were mostly ruled by Central Asian people. But soon enough, those steppe peoples were given the boot by an entrepreneurial band of Swedes who you might know. You might have heard of them before. They were called Vikings. And they established one of the most enduring dynasties of the entire Middle Ages, that being the Rurikid dynasty, what you might better know as the Kievan Rus. And they initially ruled out of Novgorod, which they called Holmgard, before moving south into Kiev. But that didn't mean that Novgorod fell off the map. In fact, it remained one of the Rurikid's great allies, with its massive economic influence and wealth serving them well on many occasions. The Novgorodians frequently bailed out the Rus and even harbored their princes during times of strife and turmoil. No one wanted to mess with Novgorod during this time period, and not just because they were a very well-defended and well-fortified settlement, but also because doing so could mean financial ruin to you and your people. That being said, the Kievan Rus did not last for very long, and after their collapse, the people of Novgorod had become used to the privileges they gained under Rus control, and I use control in big scare quotes there. And once Novgorod gained official autonomy, these Republican sentiments blossomed into the earliest incarnations of the Novgorod Republic. So how did this Republic work? Well, what it effectively was, was an assembly of free men called the Vecha, who would elect a prince to lead them. And this prince's term initially started out as being a year, but was later reduced to only six months. And even though hypothetically anyone could become the prince, it was usually selected from among the most powerful trade families. So it was effectively just an oligarchy with some extra steps, but the Prince of Novgorod did have a number of restrictions placed upon him to limit his ability to benefit economically and legally while in the position. And so it's not like corruption was completely rampant in the early days of the Republic, at the very least. And once the Republic was formed, Novgorod really made an impact 
on the map. Its previously dominant economy became absolutely unquestionable. Most of the conflicts that Novgorod had during this time were over trade, but at the same time, it also did expand its own territory at one point controlling an empire of substantial size across Russia's northern coast. The Novgorodians did also make several plays south during this time, mostly trying to snap up pieces of the dying Kievan Rus to gain under their control. Though, as you can see from this map, those weren't largely successful, uh, but that isn't to say they were entirely unsuccessful. They did, for example, fend off a Magyar bid into western Ukraine at one point, and also stop the Bulgarians from pushing north, but for the most part, their main conflicts were with their more immediate neighbors. Those being the German states and their powerful economic bloc, the Hanseatic League, the Swedes and other Scandinavian countries, and Poland-Lithuania, all of whom constituted fairly serious threats to Novgorodian sovereignty. The Byzantines, while pretty far south, also came into conflict with them during various periods since so much of northern trade was controlled by Novgorod, and the Byzantines really relied on this trade to stimulate their own economy. And lastly, there were many Turkic tribes in the region, such as the Pechenegs, that the Novgorodians frequently had to deal with. So all said, it was certainly not a quiet period for them, and it was about to get a whole lot less quiet when the Mongols started to stomp through in the mid-1200s AD. The Novgorodians put up a valiant defense, but really weren't able to do anything to stop the Mongols from swooping into Eastern Europe, and were soundly thrashed along with their allies at the Battle of Kalka River, which you can see in the Khotyan Khan campaign. And not only that, as the Mongols were storming in, the Swedes also attacked. And then after the Swedes, guess what else happened? The Teutons also attacked. And all of these attacks were thwarted by Novgorod, specifically by one man who we will get to later. And even though the Mongols were not repelled from Europe, they left Novgorod alone. It was too well fortified and very well blocked by this one big nasty marsh that the Mongols didn't want to tangle with. So instead they stormed in through Ukraine, leaving Novgorod alone. Dodged a bullet there, didn't we? But all was not well in the state of Novgorod. Though the Mongols had left the city intact for now, they were still occupying the region as its primary power. And funnily enough, though Novgorod had been making so many imperial claims during this time, it only actually officialized as a republic in about 1291, during the height of Mongol rule within the region. Now, bear in mind that Novgorod was not the only Russian power during this period. There were many other lesser Slavic states that were also squabbling over the region as well, and one of these started getting very powerful in the 1300s, namely Moscow. After Moscow came to proper power in 1327 by kicking the Mongols out of the region, they quickly gained control over Novgorod, vassalizing it, and pretty much saying, you have to do what we say, but we're going to leave your republic largely intact. And this they did for about a century until Novgorod made the very severe mistake of trying to tangle with Muscovite authority in the 1400s, eventually leading to a major Muscovite invasion in 1456. The Novgorodians then made a severe mistake, looking to Poland-Lithuania for aid, which much of their own populace saw as a betrayal, since Muscovy was seen as a much greater ally and friend to Novgorod than Poland-Lithuania, who had traditionally been their rivals. And this internal division led to a disastrous defeat at the Battle Battle of the Shiloni River in 1471, then leading to Novgorodian sovereignty officially ending in 1478 with Ivan III of Russia seizing the famous Vecha Bell of Novgorod itself, always rung to convene Republican assemblies and a symbol of the realm now under the boot heel of the Muscovite ruler. Cracks had been starting to show in Novgorod for quite some time leading up to this point. There was a lot more corruption, there was a lot more of a concentrated oligarchy and a lot more backroom deals, but this truly was the nail in the coffin to the Republic, and any final vestiges of Novgorodian sovereignty were completely squashed in 1570 during Ivan IV's famous massacre of Novgorod, in which he totally and brutally annihilated what little resistance the people of the once proud Republic had been putting up against him. And so with this summary in mind, we must ask ourselves, where is Novgorod now? Well, it is still a very prominent city in modern Russia, a major hub of commerce and industry, as it always has been, and the republican ideals of Novgorod actually inspired later communist thinkers, meaning that it tangentially led to the founding of the Soviet Union. As we'll get to later, even the word Soviet is somewhat derived from a Novgorodian term. Though how collectivist communism was derived from the distinctly capitalist and oligarchical republic 
Lican values of Novgorod is kind of a mystery to me, but that's neither here nor there. Let's move on to the flavor of the civilization. Beginning with their architecture, it's Eastern European. What a surprise. There's getting to be a lot of Eastern European architectures recently. Maybe we should split them up at some point. I'm not quite sure yet. The Novgorodians would also receive unique skins for the castle, as always, as well as the market, which is a very important building for them, unsurprisingly. Their language would be Old Novgorodian, a distinct dialect of the early Slavic languages. Pokolono, ladies and gentlemen. And their wonder would be the St. George Cathedral at Yuriev monastery. There are a lot of this particular style of church around Novgorod. White walls, great silvery domes, and so consider this kind of a placeholder for all of those writ large, and you could mix and match pieces to come up with whatever beautiful wonder you wanted to. On to campaigns. If you know anything about Novgorod, even the tiniest bit, you'll know who the only real choice is for a campaign. It's the man, the myth, the legend. Alexander Nevsky. This guy is unbelievably cool. So remember how I was talking about the Mongols invading and then the Swedes and then the Teutons? Now, who do you think pretty much dealt with all of them single-handed? It was this guy. A man whose military achievements were so great, he is remembered today often as Saint Alexander Nevsky. And so if you were gonna be designing a Nevsky campaign, you wouldn't have a very hard time doing so. You're dealing with the Mongols early on, you're dealing with the Swedes, then with the Teutons, then with the Mongols again, and then probably with some other potential Slavic rivals. I'm sure it would be a fantastic campaign. There are a lot of amazing centerpiece battles. He was a fantastic commander. It's an obvious choice, but for fun, let's just say that you couldn't pick Alexander Nevsky as the campaign protagonist for the Novgorod audience. Who else would you go with? Well, I think there's one other decent pick, namely Oleg the Wise. He was actually a Rurikid leader, the first successor to Rurik himself, the progenitor of the entire Kievan Rus. And though we know them as the Kievan Rus, they didn't actually take Kiev itself until Oleg came to power first leading from Novgorod, then taking Kiev, and from there reaching out across all of the Slavic realms, before then taking all of his power and launching a massive invasion of the Byzantines. Very ambitious for the time, and he actually kind of succeeded in doing so. I don't think that this would be just a Novgorod campaign. I could see it being like a campaign where you start as Novgorod, then become the Rus or the Kievan Rus or whatever civilization we used to represent them. So not a perfect representation of Novgorod in a campaign, but coming second place to Alexander Nevsky is no small feat. Moving on to some potential campaign appearances, there are a number of campaigns that I think you could sub in the Novgorodians to existing Slavs, just to give a little bit of variety, but I think that the main place you would see them appear is in the Algirdas and Kestutis campaign, where you are actually dealing with a number of northern Russian cities. The other place you could see them is in the Yadviga campaign, and I do see this Novgorodian build as being kind of an umbrella for other Northern Russian states. Lastly, a couple of other campaigns that I didn't think were as strong as the two listed here, but do bear mentioning in my opinion. Firstly, Yaroslav the Wise. He was another Rurikid prince coming about a century after Oleg the Wise, who started in Kiev and then took Novgorod. And unlike many of the other campaigns you might play as Novgorod, you would actually be allies with Sweden this time, joining forces with them in order to fight off pretenders to your throne, challenge the tribal Pechenegg people, and even once again attack the Byzantines. I think it could be cool, I think it could be dynamic, but I think it would be probably a strict downgrade from Oleg the Wise. Lastly, an oddball pick for you, a lesser figure named Onsifor Lukinich. Now, Onsifor was a posadnik of Novgorod. That means like a, a mayor. It's an elected position. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. And his campaign would start out in the boonies out east, fighting Turkic tribes to avenge the death of his father before returning to Novgorod to deal with political opponents and finally fighting off a major combined Swedish and Norwegian invasion of Novgorodian lands. Not as much is known about Onsifor, but he has such an interesting campaign progression that I thought he could actually make for some really interesting scenarios. And even if he's not nearly as punchy and impactful as some of the others we've discussed, I think that he could still be a contender. And now that the flavor's out of the way, let's round off the history section with major themes. What did I pick out as being recurring prominent aspects of Novgorodian history? Well, there's only one place to start. Economy. They had unbelievable economic power. They had a stranglehold on trade. They had some of the greatest craftsmen in all of Europe. They had tons of raw materials within their domain. They did 
everything. And there was no question that if you wanted to make any impact in trade in Eastern Europe, especially Northeastern Europe, you had to go through Novgorod. In fact, I would argue, having now studied a lot of history and looked at a lot of civilizations, that for their size and their time period, they had the greatest economy in history. And I do not say that lightly. That being said, economic might is not all they had. Republicanism and Republican values. They were an actual republic, a real one, for about a century. And even when their republic had fallen apart, it was still deeply sentimentalized and celebrated and kind of became part of their national pride during the medieval era. Things like that Vecha bell I was describing earlier were these enduring symbols of Novgorod and Novgorodian independence, always celebrated through the lens of contributing to their republic. That being said, they did fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, corruption became absolutely rampant. And remember when I said earlier it was just kind of an oligarchy with extra steps? Well, they removed the extra steps and it just became an oligarchy. Still an important part of their history, and since it is so sentimentalized, you couldn't do a Novgorodian build without that element of it being prominent. But the last of the themes that I noticed about Novgorod was the reluctance of their military. So. Their population were conscripted as citizen militia during times of war, and they had a hard time mustering more than like a couple thousand soldiers. Part of the reason why Alexander Nevsky is so famous is he used a relatively tiny number of soldiers to absolutely wipe the floor with incredibly large armies of well-armed, armored, and trained opponents. And speaking of armor, all citizen militia were self-armed, meaning that only the most wealthy among them could become, for example, heavy cavalry, while many others were stuck being either lightly armored cavalry archers or foot archers or spear militia. It wasn't really pretty. Uh, and it also led to a lot of very funny excuses being recorded as to why citizens said they couldn't fight. One of the most famous ones was, I can't afford armor. You think I'm gonna go on a battlefield without armor? But that brings us to the end of the history section. If that's all you were here for, thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe before you go. But for all of you who, like me, love AOE2 and want to see what I did with this civilization, let's move on to the game mechanics section. Beginning with some necessary updates. As I mentioned in my previous Moravians build, I propose a major overhaul of Slavic civilizations, specifically through the inclusion of two new regionals for all of them. The first being a regional building called the Gord. Again, if you want more details on this, take a look at my Moravian build, but to jump through it real quick, this would be kind of like a cray post, but buildable from feudal age and much, much weaker. Additionally, you can only build them within the line of sight of a town center, a castle, or another gourd, preventing you from using them offensively to castle drop your opponent early on. They can train and upgrade the Druzhenik line, which we'll get to shortly, as well as Petards. Well, uh, they also are quite cheap and relatively quick to make. It'll take a while in the feudal age, but their build time decreases age by age, so by Imperial, you can throw a gourd up very, very quickly. Now, the second Slavic regional would be the Druzhenik line. This one is a good deal more interesting. This is a very powerful infantry unit trained at a gourd or a castle, and the Druzhenik itself is available in Feudal Age if you create a gourd. They are very powerful, dominating almost all units one versus one, but there is a limit on how many you can have on the map at a time. In Feudal Age, you can only have three. And as your ages increase, and as you upgrade the unit, this increases incrementally. I think a post-imperial boyar, the final upgrade of the Druzhenik line, you can have 20 on the map at a time, which isn't very much. Uh, like I said, they have very good stats, kind of comparable to a current boyar, and while they are infantry units costing 45 food and 45 gold to create, you can also right-click one onto a stable to have them mount up becoming a cavalry unit with greater speed and HP, but of course added susceptibility to spears for 20 gold. So they are a hybrid unit, partially infantry, partially cavalry, depending on what you want to do with them. Now, these units would obviously be gained by my Moravians build, but also by a bunch of existing civilizations. The Bulgarians would have great ones, the Poles and Bohemians would have somewhat weak ones, and the Slavs, though I'm planning on splitting them, would also get them if you were determined to keep that civilization in the game. 
the crab post could stay as like a unique upgrade for the gourd on the Bulgarians, and notably the Lithuanians and Magyars, though tangentially related to the Slavic regions, would not gain access to these units. So as you're looking at my Novgorodian build, bear in mind that these two regionals would be available to them, and as it turns out, make up a pretty substantial part of their playstyle, especially the gourd. Let's move on to an overview of the civilization. The Novgorodians, an economy civilization. I use the economy tag fairly frequently in my builds, but this is the first and only civilization that I will classify as an economy civilization with no additional tag to it. They are just about eco. First bonus, all eco units, including villagers, fishing ships, trade units, train twice as fast, while all military units, including warships, train twice as slow. Wow, that's a huge game changer. And it's, I think, very well historically justified. The Novgorodians, as I have mentioned, had a monstrous economy and a military that was often very hard to get rolling. And as such, when you're playing them, you need to be playing heavily around this bonus, gathering food much faster than you normally would in early ages in order to churn out a monster economy. But also bearing in mind, it'll be a lot harder to mass units up later on to attack your opponent or to produce them quickly to respond to an enemy raid. So use this bonus wisely. It can be very much a double-edged sword. Second bonus, starting in Feudal Age, a single villager may be upgraded into a Posadnik. Limit one on the map at a time. Now, what is a Posadnik? Well, they are technically a unique unit. They're this little happy guy. He's a little villager. Uh, he doesn't cost anything. They're entirely free. Instead, the main cost of the unit is that you have to upgrade a single villager through a little key on their unit card. This would cause a animation to overlay the villager, preventing it from working or moving at all for like 60 seconds. So you're losing a lot of villager work time. Now, once you have the Posadnik upgraded, they are tankier, but slower than a normal villager and have more line of sight. They also cannot attack at all, but they do have a very good ability. Though they cannot gather, any villager or trade unit within a Posadnik's line of sight drops off more resources than normal at a rate that scales by age. This means that if you put your Posadnik near your wood line, you're getting a ton more wood. If you put it at the end of a trade line, you're getting loads of gold. If you put it right on your TC, then all the farmers around them will be dropping off more food. It allows for an incredibly flexible economy that you have to pay a little bit more attention to so that you can rebalance it by repositioning your Posadnik. But even so, if you use this little guy wisely as the Novgorod audience, this coupled with your former eco bonus will just give you an absolutely unparalleled level of economic dominance. That being said, Posadniks are pretty easy to kill, so be careful with them. They can't do anything at all to protect themselves besides garrisoning in a building. Third bonus, the town bell, when you ring it, converts the first couple villagers to reach the TC into random levy units for a timed period. Now, both the number of villagers and the amount of time it lasts scales by age. In Dark Age, you're only going to get three villagers and it's going to last like 45 seconds, so not nearly enough time to, for example, raid your opponent. But by Imperial Age, this thing will last for 90 seconds, and the amount of time you have left will display in a little bar above the unit's head, at which point they will pop right back to their normal villager status. HP is transferred as a percentage across both sides of this transformation, and the types of levies you become is based on a percentage system. For spearmen, you have the highest chance, then skirmishers, and then light cavalry is a much lower percentage. Now, obviously, this is a great defensive bonus that has the downside of making you use the town bell, which sucks, but the upside of giving you a bunch of pretty decent defensive units. Since your own units train so slowly, this is probably going to be your best way to protect yourself early on in the game, and once you get a little later, can kind of be used as a pseudo-Flemish revolution in order to bolster your army late game as they are trying to deliver the haymaker to your opponent. Having a bunch of soldiers out of nowhere, it turns out, is pretty good, even if they don't last forever. Lastly, team bonus. The market, trade units, and all market techs are available an age earlier for the Novgorodians and all of their allies. Now, not only will this let you pull off some like fast feudal shenanigans in Dark Age by building a market and selling everything to get a ton of food, but it also lets you set up trade lines sooner, research things like coinage and banking sooner, and also get guilds in Castle Age. 
So while this probably isn't going to be hugely impactful in 1v1 and won't be, I think, disgusting in team games, it will be a nice, useful bonus that will probably be best suited to help you age up early on and help smooth out your transition into trade lines a little bit during team games in late Castle and early Imperial Age. Let's move on to their other uniques, starting with their unique unit, the Tisiatsky. The Tisiatsky is an infantryman, a standard bearer infantryman armed with a sword, who has a massive cost of 100 food and 125 gold. Now, they're very tanky. They have really good line of sight, but they have really crappy attack values. And for a unique unit, are very slow to train before even taking into consideration the fact that their train time is doubled. So what's the upside? Well, the Tisiatsky serves as a production building on legs. They can train any barracks, archery range, or stable unit from a build menu that you access through the unit's card. And the units they train produce right next to them, as though they were a building walking around. And they can train while they are moving and attacking. Lastly, they are less affected by the Novgorodians military units train slower penalty, meaning that with a Tisiatsky, you have massive versatility over your army comp without being as penalized as hard for it as normal, and can move the unit around on the map to let you build an army where your opponent doesn't expect it, or reinforce the front line far quicker than your opponent might expect you are capable of doing. It's an interesting support unit. Terrible in combat, you never want these guys to actually fight. But they will help counterbalance your normally sluggish garbage military to at least the point where you remain competitive late game during spammy trash wars where normally your opponent would just be able to outproduce you. On to unique technologies, starting with their Castle Age technology, Piatini. This makes it such that whenever a villager leaves a building foundation incomplete, the building will continue to construct itself at about one-third the rate that a single villager would normally afford. If you've played Warcraft 3 before, this is how the undead build their buildings. If you played Starcraft before, this is how Protoss build their buildings. This technology is in reference to a term used for Novgorodian regional administration, kind of how they subdivided their realm, and doesn't have enormous power, instead being more of a tangential bonus. For example, when you throw down a shitload of houses. I should note, by the way, that the villager has to hit the building's foundation with their hammer at least once for this to kick in. You can't just place a foundation and then it magics itself into it existence. The other main realm I think this will help out in is in defense, letting you do something like throw down a castle, for example, and make sure that you don't get doubted out of existence if all of your villagers die, or throw up stone walls very, very quickly. It's a high micro technology and not something you'll want to pick up every game, but when you do, I think it could lend itself to some really creative and useful play options. And lastly, the Imperial Age unique technology, Sovet Gospod. This was a shadow council of the elite within late Novgorod who would kind of pull the strings behind the curtain. And the term Sovet actually lent itself to the later Soviet. This technology would temporarily reset all of the user's market prices to baseline. And it can be researched any number of times. Wow, very, very strong. If you time this well in late game, you can get massive returns off of this particular technology, but the timing window is fairly narrow and the cost is substantial. This technology costs all four resources with a particular emphasis on gold. And as you research it multiple times, that cost will substantially increase, eventually leading to a point where you really won't get much benefit out of researching it, even if you can sell a ton of resources because of how much it costs to do so. Even so, this is gonna be your main late game economy bonus as the Novgorodians, allowing you to turn all of the resources you're collecting into the exact ones you need pretty much whenever you need them. As with other elements of their economy though, it does take a little more micro than normal. That brings us to the end of the Civ overview. Make sure again to check out the Civilization document linked down below in the description if you want any further details on any element of this particular build. Let's from here jump into the technology tree. Letter grades, Spear of the Lost style, beginning with their infantry, it sucks. Their infantry is a D plus, ladies and gentlemen. The Tisiatsky is technically an infantryman, and their Druzhenik line are technically infantrymen, but they are missing so much. Champion, Halberdier, Blast Furnace, Plate Mail Armor. Remember how I was saying that they weren't particularly well equipped in Novgorod? Well, here's one of the consequences of that. 
But Robbie, you might be saying, this doesn't look that bad, but bear in mind that all of their military units train twice as slow. And for infantry, this is especially bad. With infantry, you want to be able to spam them, or in the case of the spear line, you're building them on the spot to counter cavalry. You don't want them coming out slow, and as such, I couldn't justify higher than a D plus because of that fact alone. Additionally, as you'll see later, if you're playing Druzhenix as the Novgorodians, you're almost always going to want to make them cavalry. Moving on to archers, it's a B minus. It's probably the best element of their military. They have arbalesters, heavy cavalry archers, and even Parthian tactics, but they lack thumb ring, ring archer armor, and hand cannoneer. Notably, they do not miss bracer. So while it is bad that your archers train slowly, since archers won't be dying as often on average, it's not quite as bad as with their infantrymen. And as such as the Novgorodians late game, you will probably want to have arbalesters be the backbone of your military. For their cavalry, it's a C minus. They once again have the Druzhenic line, but they lack Hussar, Paladin, Elite Step Lancer, they do have base Step Lancer though, as well as Blast Furnace and Plate Barding Armor. Bear in mind that they do have bloodlines and husbandry, meaning that you can hypothetically do scout and knight play, as well as Druzhenic play if you mount them up. It's a good deal harder since your military units train so much slower, but it is an option on the table, and your monster economy should get you to the point where you can start churning out a rush like that earlier than an opponent could to hopefully partially compensate for the amount of time it takes you to mass up the units to do it. Onto the Siege. It's a B. It's actually quite good. They have Bombard Cannon and Siege Engineers. They lack Siege Ram and Siege Onager. I felt like the Siege justified a higher grade than the rest of their units because in addition to having Siege Engineers, it's a lot less bad for Siege to be slow to create. And as such, you should be able to mass up your Bombard Cannons and Trebuchets fairly effectively. Though in a situation like an early Imperial Treb War, you're definitely going to be on the back foot. In retrospect, it might be better served as a B- to complement the Archers. Especially because Unlike with archers, your Tsiatsky cannot train siege units, so you won't be able to reinforce them to the front line as quickly and effectively as you can with other unit types. Let's talk about their defenses. It's an A! The Tsiatsky is a great defensive unit since, of course, you can keep them in your base and just churn out units left and right at far quicker than normal. You have your Gord building, which will be great for the Novgorodians early on. You actually have the economy to back it up. You have the Piatini technology, which is kind of tangentially defensive. And on top of all that, you have a perfect university and the town bell bonus to convert your villagers into fighting units early on if you get raided before you have military to defend yourself. It's it's quite good. It's actually very good. Still gonna be how a lot of games as the Novgorod audience play out. Let's move on to the economy. An S tier. I will never give this grade to any other civilization again. They have the best economy in the game, bar none, and it's justified in my opinion. The Posadnik is obviously unbelievable for your economy. They have the late game Sovet Gospod. The Pietini tech kind of helps with economy sometimes because it means that your villager work time can be better spent. In addition to that, they have every economy tech in the game. They have the faster training eco units. They have the early market stuff. The faster training eco units is just disgusting. That by itself could bring any civilization to an A tier economy. It is the best economy in the game and it needs to be because God, their military is awful. Let's look at their levies. Again, levies is my word for trash units, units that don't cost gold. Tsiatskis will often want to be producing trash units since those are the units you want to be spamming to the front line very often to die in droves. And since the Tsiatski will train them quickly, it means that you won't have to worry as much about getting bogged down while your opponent overmasses you. That being said, they do lack a number of trash foundations. In addition to all of those damage and armor technologies mentioned earlier, they don't have Halberdier, they don't have Hussar, and most brutally, they don't have Conscription. And so while it might seem like the Novgorodians would have good trash spam late game, and they certainly have the economy for it, the slowness and poor quality of their units is definitely going to get the better of them in many situations. Their dock. It's a C+. Plus. They don't have Elite Cannon Galleon or Shipwright, but other than that, they have a perfect dock tech tree, and they also have a disgusting economy with an amazing fish boom. That being said, warships train so freaking long that having them train twice as slow will really hurt on water maps. Not insurmountable, I think Novgorod could be a very fine contender on water maps, but far from the sort of thing you're going to be prioritizing over a committed naval civilization. And lastly, they're monks. It's a B. They're missing illumination. Oh no. 
Uh, and most importantly, their monks aren't affected by the slower or faster sides of the train time bonus, and so they're just going to play normally, and will probably be what you want to use to defend against early knights in almost all situations, because it will be hard for you to train up spearmen in time to protect. Now we come to the end of the tech tree. Let's take a look at what this means for the Novgorodians' hypothetical playstyle beginning with their early game. Guess what you're doing in the early game? You're using your economy bonuses to have an unprecedented resource advantage over your opponent. You have a monstrous economy. But that being said, that won't help you if your opponent is storming through your base with early rushes. And because of that, you really need to prioritize your defenses early in order to preserve your economy advantage. You get resources really fast, so you need to spend them really fast. And remember that rushes as this civilization are not impossible. You just need to start them much earlier to make sure that you can churn them out in time that they actually have any sort of impact. Lastly, the Gord is probably going to be your best friend early game. You will have enough villagers that you can actually commit a lot of them to build one up quickly. And since your soldiers will be so unreliable, having a Gord to defend key resource nodes is really something you're going to want to rely on as the Novgorodians in many situations. On to their mid game. Once again, you're mostly going to be playing defensive in the mid game, using your town center town bell bonus to fend off enemy attacks. Piantinia can kind of help sometimes, but you really want to keep your eco up so that you can fund your late game army. That's not to say that knight and crossbow play is impossible, but once again, like with rushes, you need to be planning for it. I wouldn't recommend using the Tisiatsky too much in Castle Age, just because army sizes will be so small that it will be much harder to protect them versus something like being sniped by enemy archers or outflanked by enemy knights. In the late game, however, the Novgorodians are very strong. They have their Tisiatsky for huge mobile armies that are very adaptable to the opponent's strategy, reinforce instantaneously, and even though your individual troop quality generally sucks, you have a lot of variety. Like, you're missing a good number of technologies, but you still have a lot of very serviceable units that are just worse than average. Uh, you also do have a couple of decent power units at your side. Your mounted boyars are quite good, and you also have very good arbalesters that do very high damage, as well as some decent siege options. Your eco is so strong as the Novgorod audience, but you still need to be intelligent with how you spend those resources. If you and your opponent are in a late game grind fest scenario and you aren't making use of alternative tactics, making heavy use of your Tisiatsky, other advantages that you have, your enemies will still win the game because they'll be able to overrun your army before you can rebuild it in time. As such, even though the late game is where the Novgorod audience will shine, they still are not completely invulnerable by any means whatsoever. And remember, just because late game is where the Novgorod audience thrive doesn't mean that they can't do anything in the earlier stages. You have a lot of different tactics, but you probably will need to adapt your normal build paths very substantially to better fit their highly unusual playstyle. Let's move on to some loose threads. Unanswered questions that are still on my mind even after finishing this build. Beginning with some uncertainties. The train time thing, man. I, I'm sure a lot of you will be like, Robbie, this is the single stupidest thing you've ever put into a build, but I'm not sure. I, I think it's actually kind of fair. In fact, I'm really not sure whether it's broken or like terrible. Age of Empires has never really seen a bonus like this that so heavily skews the way you play the game. And there's a very good chance it's just too much, but I, I do really like the historicity of it. I'm determined to keep a bonus like this on the build. I just think there's a decent chance I took it too far in this particular instance, which I have been known to do. I often take things too far. Uh, it's, it's a really dramatic design for the civilization. Um, I could see very much toning down the train bonus, which I see as being kind of the, the main offender of the bunch. Uh, if you guys can math out some sick explanations in the comments, I'd love to read through them. Lastly, the signet, uh, like the Civ Ensign, it's a little similar to the Lithuanians in terms of its color and shape. But that's a very small point. It is actually very historically accurate. It just kind of bothers me from an aesthetic level. On to some table ideas. These are things that didn't make it into the build, but I was strongly considering. One, villagers cost gold, like a good deal more gold, in addition to their base food cost, but are tankier and work faster. This was kind of my attempt at the train time bonus before I went with that instead. Another one, ecotechs improve market prices, possibly even resource specific. So if you research crop rotation, then your food prices improve. Something along those lines. 
Is the idea cool? Yes. Is it fitting? Absolutely. But I had enough eco stuff that I liked better at this point in the design process. Another one. All soldiers are trained by promoting villagers into soldiers at military buildings. Wow, that would be a massive departure from the norm. That would be so cool, wouldn't it, guys? Guys? Uh, no, don't leave. Don't close the video, please. Please, please. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. Moving on, I also toyed around with the idea of them gaining the Viking and Longship off of my Scandinavian builds as regional units. Novgorod was initially settled by the Scandinavian peoples who went on to found the Rurika dynasty. And as I will get to in a moment, these Viking origins definitely remained a part of Novgorod for quite a while to come. Uh, another idea I had was removing bloodlines. You know how much I like removing bloodlines, but I wasn't about to make their cavalry that bad. Uh, onto some unique units, uh, the Namestnik. This was like a church official who also had some command over local militias and administration. I thought of them as like a tanky missionary that had an AOE heal and could fight while its conversion was on cooldown. Uh, neat little idea, but not nearly as synergistic with their overall game plan as the Tisiatsky. Uh, another one, the Jitie Liudi. Uh, this would be a citizen who you would train from a castle. They would be able to work like a villager, and they would have a one-time ability to promote into an elite unit besides Siege. So from their little command card, you could click on any, like an Arbalester or a Knight or even a Druzhenik, and there would be a little overlay, and it would quickly transform that villager into that unit for cheaper than if you had just trained the unit at a military building. I really liked this idea, but I felt like the Tiesiatsky was a better way of communicating the way that citizens of all social strata were transformed into soldiers while being definitely more synergistic with their overall game plan. It's a really cool idea. It might make an appearance on a future build, but definitely takes too much micro for the payoff that it has as of now. Uh, another one, the Kolop. Uh, this would be an incredibly cheap villager available from Feudal Age. You might even get them for free periodically, but they would be really bad, like much lower work rate, much lower HP. Uh, and I considered them as a regional unit. Uh, the Kolop was like uh, an indentured servant or slave that was very common across all Slavic lands. They were also often conscripted into military service, especially as cavalrymen. So something along that line, like turning your Kolops into cavalry archers or something, that could be cool as well. I'm definitely tempted to make this a regional unit, but I don't think my Slavic builds need any more weirdness as of now. Just know that you might see this idea come in in a later build. And now onto some unique technologies that didn't make the build. Ushkui. Uh, this was a term for a pirate ship, a Novgorodian pirate ship. Like I said, the Vikings stayed in their blood for quite some time. And Ushkoi, piloted by Ushkoniks, who were pirates, made frequent raids along all of the rivers that Novgorod had access to for pretty much the entirety of their prominence during the Middle Ages. Uh, I have Ushkoi as a unique technology that would make it such that whenever a transport ship died, it would spawn some units on the nearest coastline. Not the units it was carrying, but random ones, probably mostly levies. Just as a way to give you a little bit of compensation for your transports getting destroyed, as well as letting you suicide transports in order to get quick soldiers onto an enemy's island. Neat idea. I think there's probably a better way of doing this. I considered the Ushkoi or Ushkoinik as a unique unit as well, but I didn't want the Novgorod audience to focus as much on water, especially given that they have such a weird playstyle already. Another unique technology, the Vecha Bell. This would make your town bell give substantial healing, armor, and speed to all within the radius of the bells ringing, especially to villagers. Uh, I didn't want to double up on town bell effects, and I really liked the conscription one. If I ever had to remove the conscription effect, I would definitely implement Vecha Bell as a technology on this build. Another one, a familiar face this time, Detonets. This wouldn't work like it does on the current Slavs. Instead, it would make it so that all castles gain all town center functionalities, training villagers, researching technologies, advancing ages even, and all town centers become tankier. Why is that? Well, Detonitz was the name for like a fortified town center. Obviously, you can interpret that as a castle, but I like it representing more of a TC castle interplay than just focusing on one over the other. And lastly, Tion. This was the name of like an economic council of merchants within Novgorod. This would allow you to re-research certain Imperial Age economy technologies like guilds, crop rotation, and two-man saw. This would obviously be a massively powerful late game economy bonus, and I could see it replacing the current Sovet Gospod if anyone finds anything horrifically broken with that technology that I didn't catch. And now with our loose threads tied off, 
we come to the end of this particular Novgorodians build. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you find this interesting. Before we sign off, let's take a look at the likelyometer. In my opinion, how likely is it that the Novgorodians are added to the game at some point in the future, possibly even somewhat resembling the build I have for them here? And for this episode, the Novgorodians receive on the likelyometer a... 4 out of 10. I think it's possible. Uh, the, a Slav subdivision, a further Slav subdivision, does seem like something the game might try in a little while, but I don't think it will happen for several years at the very, very least. And even if it did, I don't think the Novgorodians are a guaranteed pick over someone like the Vlachs or the Albanians or even the Moravians who I did earlier. That being said, I do think they are a considerable choice being a rare example of a medieval republic with such a distinct interplay between their military and economy, I personally think they would be a fantastic addition to the game. And for a booming clown like me, they are a, a perfect fit from a playstyle perspective. But that's just my opinion. Now I want to hear from you. Tell me about it down in the comment section. How did you like this build? What would you have done differently? Is it as crazy and wacky and imbalanced as I'm guessing you'll think it is? Or do you think I actually hit a fairly decent interplay between its different bonuses? Regardless, I want to hear from you, and I especially want to hear what you want to see me do in future on this channel. Once again, a huge shout out to my buddies over at Gamer Legion. Thank you so much for shouting out the channel. It's very kind of you to extend some love towards the smaller Age of Empires creators out there, and I am eternally grateful for you taking the time to contact me. But with all that being said, my name is Robbie Howell. And ciao for now, everyone.